Okay. Um, welcome, welcome. So this is our June community webinar. And in June, oftentimes we like to talk about research because it's a time of year where some of you are regrouping and thinking about what you're doing in terms of rank and promotion and that book chapter you might want to write and that um, research that you want to do. And in the COIL virtual exchange world, this is one of those topics that is really a head scratcher, which means it's hard to figure out. So we're thrilled that we have um, people today who are willing to jump off the cliff with us because um, this is different for different places in the world. This is um, thorny in terms of dealing with FERPA and GDPR. And so I'm so thankful that Sharmila is willing to um, lead us into today's adventure. Um, and thank you all for being part of the SUNY COIL community. As you know, we are almost 200 strong and um, we're thrilled that you're here. And um, we have events throughout the year and this community webinar is free to the whole community. And these events are recorded and we will be in the month of July putting together a YouTube channel for all of you to enjoy. Um, so with that, I hand it over to Sharmila. And just a reminder, we will have no community webinar in June and we will start back up in August. So with that, Sharmila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hope. Uh, before I get started, Emmy is going to launch a couple of polls. So if you can all kind of participate in this poll, that would be great. So we're gonna have three questions. Um, we just wanna get a sense of who all is here in terms of your role with COIL um, and your experience level with scholarship or publication. Um, so you can scan the U uh, QR code or go to menti.com and use the code that's at the top of the screen here. All right, so we have a number of COIL coordinators. We have some people that wear multiple hats in the room. Great to see. All right, we'll move on to our next question here. We wanna get a sense of any scholarship or publication activity at your institution. Um, if you know that there's a lot going on, some going on, uh, maybe a little bit. Um, but I think one of the, the things we, we realized when we were exploring this topic is that we don't know a lot of the activity that's going on either. Um, and that's something that can be better documented at each of our institutions. All right, so it looks like we got a good mix here. All right, and last question, we wanna get a sense of you all personally, what your level of involvement has been so far. A lot of work, some work, um, or not yet, and this is gonna be a nice launching point. All right, again, good mix here. Thank you all. So thanks everyone and welcome to the SUNY COIL community webinar where we are going to be talking with our research colleagues from US and South Africa. My name is Sharmila Udhyavar and I'm an Associate Director for Global Education at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My work mainly focuses on internationalization at home activities and one of these programs that I run is COIL and virtual exchange. As COIL administrators and practitioners, we recognize that the body of research on COIL is highly un underrepresented. It looks like not as bad as we would have thought because there seems to be quite a lot of activity going on through the polls that we just did. But the impact of COIL within certain disciplines as well as longitudinal impact studies is still very lacking. Conducting research requires the collection of data. It requires obtaining permissions, including IRBs. Uh, it requires ethics and compliance, among many other requirements. 
So today's webinar will kind of delve into these crucial topics. It will acknowledge the guidelines, requirements, and procedures that can vary from country to country. We also have a colleague from Brazil. I'm sorry, I didn't mention her earlier. So, it, so we'll talk a little bit about the procedures and requirements in different countries, as well as within different institutional types within the United States. And our panelists will share with all of us their approaches to how they navigate this process. And they will also share some tools and resources that they have developed to assist others in this quest. We hope that this session will enhance your understanding and your implementation of effective research practices in COIL. So today's panelists are, and I'm just gonna quickly read their bios, Laura Cruz, who is currently a research professor at uh, Penn State University in teaching and learning scholarships. Uh, she was also a visiting professor and Fulbright specialist at the University of Pristina in Kosovo. She partners with Penn State instructors and their partners to develop and disseminate COIL on virtual exchange. And she's also the editor-in-chief of a journal that publishes research on virtual exchange. Tiffany McCory is the Associate Director for Global Academic Engagement at Penn State. She formerly served as the professor in charge for Experiential Digital Global Engagement, EDGE, which is the Penn State's equivalent of COIL. She has developed seven collaborative EDGE projects with international partners in Kazakhstan, Israel, Russia, and Brazil. Lisa Woodley is a faculty in the School of Nursing at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She's a COIL faculty fellow and a COIL champion uh, in many ways. Together with her international partner, Dr. Mayara Rodriguez de Santos from the University of Sao Paulo, they have integrated COIL into a required undergraduate pediatric nursing course for over 800 undergraduate nursing students from both US and Brazil over a three-year time span. Their research methodology incorporates both quantitative and qualitative approaches. Her partner, Dr. Mayara R. Santos, is an assistant professor at the School of Nursing, University of Sao Paulo, Dr. Santos has been a researcher and has taught pediatric and family nursing for undergraduate and graduate courses, and has recently partnered with Lisa to engage in international learning opportunities and research. Divinia Jitu is a specialist in international education at the Durban University of Technology. She has extensive experience in higher ed internationalization with a keen focus on internationalization of the curriculum. She has developed expertise in COIL as an approach to inclusive internationalization. So having introduced them, we will now turn it over to Laura and Tiffany, who will share their experiences from a U.S. context and discuss institutional support, as well as share a wonderful resource that they have developed at Penn State. So over to you, Laura and Tiffany. Well, uh, it's actually going to, you're only going to hear my voice because unfortunately my colleague Tiffany has laryngitis. Uh, so I, I will channel my inner Tiffany to the extent that I possibly can. And I'm sure I can speak for Tiffany and say she's happy to answer questions in the chat that I can't see while I am presenting. So uh, we will be a team, if not uh, uh, two voices in our team. So um, uh, I'm sorry, can I just interrupt one second? So to all the panelists, I just want to remind everybody on the call that there are many people joining us who um, English is not their first language. And so just for the sake of global um, recognition, if you could speak slowly, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely. So at Penn State, uh, Penn State is a research intensive university. So research is very valued and it's a way that we uh, uh, exercise leadership and voice uh, that is widely recognized across our campus. Uh, we also have a, a large number of faculty who participate in our COIL projects, which we call EDGE, uh, who are full-time teaching faculty, which means they're not on the tenure line. And for them to be promoted in rank from assistant to associate professor, uh, research, published research on things like COIL counts uh, and enables them to advance. So, so we have kind of a built-in motivation to want to do research on COIL on the part of our faculty. But uh, there are clearly, uh, there's some steep learning curves uh, that Tiffany and her colleagues have been able to identify and see that, 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 that there's some things that uh, require, um, that are daunting, you might say, and that get in the way of that research happening. And one of those 
is IRB. And so for those of you who don't know, IRB stands for Institutional Review Board, and that is the ethics approval, that's ethics, research ethics compliance in the United States. So what you see here on the right, this is the IRB form that Penn State uses for research on COIL projects. And I've circled on the bottom, this is the first of 35 pages of a form that folks have to fill out before uh, and, and, and set them for review before they can do research on any kind of teaching and learning and COIL in particular. So some of you who are in the United States and who fall under institutional review board approval may say, hey, our form doesn't look like this. And that's true. In the United States, the federal government establishes guidelines for ethics review, but each institution can interpret those guidelines. They have a fair amount of latitude and how those guidelines are interpreted. So an IRB approval form is going to look very different at different institutions in the United States. Some of them may not be 35 pages long, but uh, the language included in them, so in addition to length, the language including in them can be off-putting, uh, can be scary, can be unclear, uh, and often uses sort of compliance language like the word audit. Uh, so, so, so the document itself uh, can serve as, uh, as, as an initial barrier. But what I often tell the folks that I work with is that uh, because this document covers all forms of research on human subjects, um, a lot of it doesn't apply. In fact, in a typical um, IRB form here at Penn State, I write not applicable 78 times on this form. So what I tell people is don't let the form scare you. Most of it does not apply. And for those of you who are COIL program coordinators, you can create templates that, that write that not applicable 78 times so that people can focus just on the parts that you have to write out uh, for something like research on COIL. And I will say in other countries that the, the ethical review is not structured like this. There are some countries we've worked with where the federal government controls everything and the institutions control nothing. And we've certainly worked with countries where it, it is all of this process is owned by individual institutions or organizations. There's a wide range of practice and we'll hear more about that from some of our other panelists. So once we get past the sort of sticker shock or, or the idea that, uh, that how scary looking this document looks, there are two other frequent challenges that we see in doing research on COIL. And the first one you see illustrated here is terminology. So you see that the lowest level of review is called exempt. And so many faculty see that and think that means that uh, if the project falls under the guidelines for exempt research, that means they're exempt from having to go through the IRB approval process to have ethics review approved for their work. And that is not the case. Uh, the exempt level of IRB review is simply the lowest level. It's usually that with minimal risk, as it says here on the slide. Uh, it is still a level of IRB review. You still have to put in that IRB form and it has to be reviewed by an IRB analyst. What the term means is that you're exempt from the more formal review levels above it, but not that you're exempt from review of any kind. So that's a frequent misconception that if you meet those lower standards of not a high risk, uh, one of the categories for exemption is educational research, uh, so they think they do not have to go through this process. And most of the time, that is not the case. Uh, but also, most of the time, most research falls under this exempt level, which is the lowest level of review. It is usually the simplest, and it's usually the fastest. Many universities, including not Penn State, but where I've worked before, have a fast lane, right? a shorter process for exempt research studies. But it doesn't mean you're exempt from review at all. And the second challenge that we see quite often is uh, the idea of consent. So when you do a COIL project, there's a lot of upfront preparation and planning that you have to go into. And what frequently happens is somebody does all that work, they have a great experience, and they say, oh, I want to do research on it now that we've seen how, how wonderful it can be and how much the students get out of it. But it can be very challenging to do retroactive consent. So if you don't think about doing the research until the project is over, it can be 
difficult to go back and get consent. So this is a federal guideline in the United States, and some universities allow retroactive consent in very, very prescribed circumstances, and some universities don't allow it at all. Uh, and Penn State is one of those. We, we, you cannot do retroactive consent. If the course is over, there's nothing you can do. So one of the things we really wanted to do is get ahead of that and enable faculty who were doing COIL projects to be more proactive. Right, to be able to have that consent in place uh, and that approval in place at the beginning of the project rather than the end. And that was what allowed us to create what we initially called our, our, our COIL umbrella. And the idea behind the COIL umbrella is that we would file a single IRB that would cover, encompass like an umbrella, <laughs> Uh, most of the most common research strategies used in doing research on COIL courses. And that way, faculty wouldn't have to file an individual IRB. They wouldn't have to go through that process themselves. They would simply do a short application with us, and they could be added underneath this umbrella. So it turns out that the word umbrella actually means something very specific in IRB land, and we are not allowed to call it that. Uh, but so think of it as a conceptual umbrella uh, rather than a, a specific research term, but the principle is the same. So because I work with many faculty uh, who want to do research on all kinds of teaching and learning, but also on COIL, I did know the most common approaches to research that they use. And so we were able to put those, those approaches together and all of these come under that IRB umbrella uh, so that if you do research on COIL and you wanna do a pre and post survey, you wanna do student peer evaluation, you wanna use reflection artifacts or other artifacts from your course, or you wanna do a photo narration research project, all of these are covered, any of these pathways through research are covered through our, our umbrella project. But the umbrella doesn't just include the IRB. So when we expand it out to talk about a toolkit, what we've tried to do is put everything together that faculty might need, that instructors might want to enable them to do research on their COIL projects. So the toolkit has not only the approved IRB, but it also has all, we now have 11 surveys that have been validated and are already built into Qualtrics, our online survey tool, so that if someone wants to use one of these surveys, we simply make a copy and it's ready to go. They also have guides to how you do this kind of research. It also has examples from both Penn State faculty and other faculty that they can draw from. Uh, and it has, in some cases, like with photo narration, it has templates uh, for how to design assignments that you can then assess for research purposes. The idea behind the toolkit is that hopefully we will put everything you might need in here, everything in a box to be able to do research on your COIL project all in one place and with guidelines to help you think about what kinds of research you wanna do, what kinds of evidence you wanna collect and all the forms that you might need to do that, including the IRB forms, the consent forms, all of that kind of stuff, all in one place. And I know many of you are COIL coordinators. The added benefit of this toolkit uh, is that it enables data collection beyond the individual course. So part of the toolkit, if you come in under our IRB and our toolkit, is we have the right to use your data. So right now we have 17 active projects in the toolkit, and four of them are using the same survey, for example. So what we can do at the program level is aggregate those stu student responses to the same survey and start building in some multi-classroom, multidisciplinary, institutional level research projects, uh, more robust projects that can capture larger numbers uh, and, and give us insight into uh, what and how our students are learning through their COIL projects. So I'm going to give you two quick examples of things that have toolkit projects and some of the IRB issues that we have navigated very quickly. So we work with a global agricultural faculty member here who works with, uh, partnered with a, uh, a part, an international partner at a university in Russia. And I'm deliberately not going to say the name uh, because 
what happened was that faculty member uh, wanted to, that we wanted to do a research on this project. So Penn State, like most research universities in the United States, will not cover research activities in a university other than Penn State. So at the exempt level, what it is required that the other university has to get research approval on their side. So the Penn State IRB covers what happens at Penn State, Penn State students, and the IRB will have to be done by the international partner. Well, in this case, that was easy because uh, the university in Russia had a already had a, an ethics review process in place that only was done by email. So it was very simple. We had permission. And the only thing we had to do was translate the consent and recruitment documents into Russian uh, so that it would be as transparent as possible for the student participants. And that's generally considered a good practice in this field. But here's the rub. The, the university partner changed universities. Uh, and moved to a different country. So we had to navigate this process all over again and had to figure out what that country was doing, translate it into a different language and, and start over. And then she moved again throughout the partnership to a third university in a third country. And we had yet again to follow a different process and procedure from that country to get uh, ethics approval there and then retranslate all the documents into the third language as well. But now we have a bank of, of, fair, of, of a lot of language for consent and recruitment. Uh, we now have that somewhere where people can access it that is in three different languages. So we're starting to try to build up uh, a, a database of, of consent and recruitment documents that utilize different languages. My second example is from education. And this was a partnership between a Penn State faculty member and a research university in France that's a long-standing partner uh, with Penn State, this university. We've worked with them often. France has a well-established ethics review process that we were familiar with and that we had navigated before and that we had material recruitment and consent materials already written in French that just needed a little revising for the particular project. It's going to be great. Super easy peasy. However, we... Uh, this particular faculty member wanted to record presentations where the students were doing teachbacks. So they were teaching a concept to each other, right, across the COIL partnership. And uh, Hope alluded to this earlier, there was a change about data security policies in the European Union that uh, they weren't sure how video presentations would apply. And so they didn't have an existing policy on what to do about the ethics of recorded presentations that obviously contain a lot of identifiable information. So it was a lengthy process to try to work out how this might work. And it actually uh, required, we sent Tiffany and, and, and some of my colleagues went over to France to work, this, work through this with them in person uh, to try to determine what to do. And ultimately, we were able to get a solution. Uh, it took a lot of conversations. It took a lot of processing. Um, but I think the reason I brought up this example is too, is that when you're talking about research ethics, it's not necessarily just what's on the IRB. In this case, data security and privacy laws were both factors in trying to determine whether we could get clearance to do this. In the United States, we have FERPA, uh, which is Oh boy, I have no idea what that stands for, but it's uh, it covers uh, student records. Uh, that is also often uh, you know part of the conversation when you talk about IRB and increasingly data security and privacy issues are coming up in a lot of different contexts. So part of this compliance isn't just necessarily uh, with with strictly IRB standards, but there are other things involved. And so with that, I want to hand it over to our next our next presenters, our next panelists, who can tell you about. Um, sort of how they've navigated these procedures uh, within their COIL context. Yep. Sorry, uh, I was saying something and didn't realize that I was muted, but what I was saying was thanking you for sharing your wonderful toolkit and uh, passing it along to Lisa and Mayara, who will share their experience with collaborative research and their separate but parallel data collection that led to a shared data analysis. So Lisa and Mayara, please take it from here. 
Thank you, um, both Laura as well as Sharmila, and of course, Hope and Emmy for the warm welcome. We are excited to have you all here with us, and it's our pleasure to share a little bit about our specific project that we have been working on. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting Mayara back in, we decided this morning it was April of 2021. Uh, it seems like we've known each other a lot longer than that because we have been collaborating on a yearly basis, uh, literally talk to each other at least once a week. Um, but most of our research has been around um, having our students explore through COIL what it really means to provide family-centered nursing care to, um, to families who both reside in the US as well as Brazil. And the targeted families that we are um, looking at are those who have a child with a chronic condition. Both Mayara and I teach pediatric nursing. And so we were very fortunate in that we had a lot of things in common right off the bat. And we wanted to talk a little bit about sort of how this collaboration came to be. Um, so we met each other. Um, we both uh, were very passionate about teaching and working with our students. We are both pediatric nurses um, in our clinical backgrounds. And so we really um, thought about how we could energize and inspire our students. Um, so what we have designed is a COIL activity that has now been running for three years plus, and we have engaged more than 800 students at this point. Um, it has continued to evolve and grow like any other educational um, project does, um, but we actually started our data collection and our IRB from the inception of this project. So um, we certainly can relate to um, many of the things that Laura described in terms of IRB. Um, one of the things that we found was that there was no um, existing um, existing survey that we could use. At the time that we started our COIL project, um, COIL, although it had been around, um, it has been around SUNY for quite a while, but it was really just kind of getting off the ground during the pandemic. And we really wanted to explore some of the specifics around nursing students and what are nursing students learning. Um, because our students go on and they practice and they work with so many different diverse families, we really wanted to get a sense of what that would look like. Um, so I am quite happy to share a preview of our survey um, with you all in the chat. And I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. I hope that you are able to click on that link. Um, this link will allow you to take a look at the types of questions that we asked, as well as how we designed our COIL um, data gathering, and that was through a retrospective um, pre-post study. We have um, gathered a lot of data, as you can imagine, and um, our data collection has involved anonymous voluntary participation and through an online link so that um, student um, um, confidentiality is maintained. So yes, as Laura was describing earlier, not only are we having to be very careful with IRB uh, in terms of making sure that students do not feel coerced or that their participation in any way is tied to maybe how they might do in a course, but in addition, because of FERPA, which is like um, sort of HIPAA for, for students, that's always what I think of, these are important considerations. As we started I, our IRB process, we had to um, begin that process very early. Um, at the University of North Carolina, we did um, garner an exempt uh, um, IRB um, status. And so that meant that we could get our data collection going, but I believe that we started the process back in around June, and then we were able to get um, that approval from the IRB at the exempt level, if I remember correctly, around October. It does take a while for the IRB process. 
even though this is an educational um, intervention, which is really looking at the efficacy in our case of this type of teaching pedagogy to have the students learn and be able to apply some of these key global learning concepts, and the risk is very low, it still requires uh, a fair amount of time to have students or have the application, excuse me, go through the IRB process. And in our case at the University of North Carolina, we did have an additional um, level of IRB um, um, sort of uh, scrutiny, if you will, and that's because it was an international project that would involve data from another school in another country. And that was um, something that we had to build in extra time for because just the very fact that you are doing data collection with students, not only from your home university, but from an international university, means that then the uh, level of security, the level of privacy, the level of um, making sure that no students are, are um, you know, that, that it remains anonymous and optional, all of those things require an extra step, at least at UNC Chapel Hill. We also um, have done a second IRB process, and that is because as we were um, gathering this information from our quantitative studies, we were learning pretty quickly and pretty significantly and consistently that COIL was in fact a very useful and powerful tool for our students to learn things like culturally responsive nursing care, things like making sure that, um, you know, they're understanding what it's like to work with diverse families, those kinds of concepts that are really important in nursing. And so as a result, we did a second IRB that was wanting to gather qualitative information through focus group discussions. And so um, that again was a fairly, um, it was a fairly lengthy process in terms of time. It took us about three months. There was a little bit of back and forth, but again, it was mostly because of the international component. And I'm going to turn it over now to my friend and, and partner, Mayara, who is going to talk a little bit more about things like making sure that we have very accurate and careful um, translation that's happening and some of the um, parallel processes that she has gone through through Brazil. Thanks so much, Lisa, Sharmila, Hope, and Laura. And thanks everyone. Uh, to join us here today. Um, so um, actually the same the same extra caring that Lisa had because of because it was an international research, we had here too because uh, for our for Brazilian law it is important to really describe how data will be managed in both countries, um, how this data will be protected and what's the benefits for Brazil and what's the participation of Brazilian institution and Brazilian researchers. So we have to describe a little bit of this in the research project and in the proposal that we are submitting. And because we wanted to do qualitative research because we had a question for that. So first we had uh, to, to think about the steps for the research project and that took a little time too. So Lisa is saying that, yeah, and I agree. I think it was something about four months, the time that took for the IRB. But before that, we had to, to, to do the project, to do, do the research project, to think about the aims, the research questions and this kind of thing. And all the, the nuances that we needed for the research project. And when we decided to do a qualitative part, because we really needed to understand how the, this experience was for students in terms of the impacts of COIL in their education, um, we had interviews, we had focus groups, and we have narratives from students. And I had it in Portuguese, Lisa did it in English. And to work with this data, we had to, I, I could not translate it all because this is very time consuming 
And this is something that we need to think before starting the research to time, uh, if we're gonna have any funding, if not, how we're gonna do to make this happen without funding. Because if I had funding, I could send someone to translate and then we could work with the data together, but that was not the fact. So we had to translate uh, and to translate it. So we did the, that's why we did the analysis separately. So we monthly meeting, sometimes weekly meet together to be sure that we were aligned in the process. Uh, about the doing the analysis. And after doing the analysis, some part of the data that was important to the analysis, to the categories that we formed, we had translated. So we just translated part of the, 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 pro the interview because um, for translating, we have to do like, I, I translate Portuguese to, to English, then we do like a back translation just to make sure that this is what they mentioned in Portuguese. And then we do like a third, uh, second version in English, just to make sure that we are not gonna lose the meanings that is in the, the, the codes. So this was a little bit about uh, the process of translating and working with qualitative data. Uh, the requirements here for our IRB are quite the same. We had some just a little differences because of our resolution. So uh, here in Brazil, just to share a very, maybe if there are some people from Brazil that might be interested in that, but we have, um, our faculties are very used to the IRB process because we are a research university, but sometimes not everyone is used to it. So we have like a committee ethics, uh, research committee ethics in the country and institution have their own. And we have to go and do it in what we call Plataforma Brasil, that it's like an official, um, official website where we put all the information of the research. I will just share very quickly with you, just for you to make uh, an idea on how this is. So this is our, it's a government page. So this is, of course, is in Portuguese, but it's just for you to, to take a look. That is uh, the official system that we launch the researches and all we have here. So we just go here and add all this, the information that Laura said we add in here. It's about... 32 pages too, it's like a lot, a lot of different uh, things, sometimes questions that we don't even know how to answer, but we have to adapt because they are so closed in, the, in some kind of format for research. And when we are gonna do a different format of research, we have to adapt it. But um, it's a long process, but it was a very important process, not only for um, our research per se, but also to help us to improve COIL each semester. So, yes. So now I'll, I'll, I'll turn just back to Lisa. Maybe she can share a little bit of how it was the process in, in, in UNC too. Yes, very similar for our process. Although I would say that if you are going through an IRB application, and you haven't done this before. I noticed in our poll at the beginning that some people are um, maybe new to this um, kind of activity in academia. When you are trying to go for an exempt, that there is um, a little bit of a, a smaller set of questions that you do have to answer. And generally, so when you open up an IRB application and you look at the entire um, form, it can look really daunting, but if you are going for an exempt research, which oftentimes educational research falls under, it's not the same as collecting um, clinical data, cells, um, you know, that sort of thing from patients, because the risk is very low. Um, you will have a, a smaller set of questions to answer. I think from my point of view, the big things that the IRB wanted to hear from our end was that there was no uh, perceived coercion that might happen with the students, that the um, information gathering would happen after the semester was over, 
after final grades had been turned in, that there was a time frame that happened so that um, you know, the students didn't feel any kind of personal obligation to um, us as researchers. And that was something that Mayara and I had to consider because not only were we doing this research and, um, you know, co-investigators with this project, but we were also the ones teaching the students. And so we do have to be careful that students don't feel pressure to, um, to be able to participate. So having said that then, we really can't do things like allotting class time to fill out surveys, which of course would allow your survey response to go up, but that would in introduce an element of perceived coercion in that. So, you know, things like that. Uh, certainly with our focus groups, one of the things that the students did was self-assign um, pseudonyms to use during those focus groups. Um, they actually, it ended up being a lot of fun because a lot of them self-assigned things like their dogs' names <laughs> and things like that. And so we enjoyed very much um, the humor that went along with that and um, that we had some really good, fruitful discussions. Uh, the other last thing I would say for us is that the quantitative data collection has been really interesting and through some of the statistical analysis that we've been able to do, we're really able to tease out how COIL impacts groups differently. And that is something that um, I think is still really underreported in the literature. But then the focus groups have really allowed us to get an in-depth understanding of why students found this experience so impactful. So the two together have been really interesting for us. And yes, it was not, I'm sure, 305 um, yeah. <laughs> months. I am excited to now turn this over to the next group that is um, presenting, and that is Davinia. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Okay, so moving over to South Africa and, um, you know, research on COIL and, you know, the data collection um, processes. Um, just move over to the next slide. So in South Africa, we have quite a, a stringent ethics approval process for, for research at um, our public uh, universities. Um, and we govern by a number of legal frameworks and policies, but in the context of um, data management and the research, we are bound to the ethics guidelines of each of our universities and the National Protection of Personal Information Act, or POPIA, as they call it. So the Act 4 of 2013 enforces the right um, to protection against unlawful collection, uh, retention, dis dissemination, and use of personal in information. So what does this mean for conducting research? Each research project requires ethics approval from the university um, where the data collection is happening. And in cases where there are more than one um, or more data collection sites, like in the case of of COIL, gatekeeper permission um, is also necessary. So when conducting research in COIL, as mentioned by some of the, the other colleagues, the, the application for research ethics should be done um, beforehand because in South Africa and particularly at uh, DUT, um, the retrospective ethics approval isn't, isn't granted. Um, so this is in addition to ensuring the anonymity and the voluntary basis for students in order to get your, your research ethics. There's also the, the POPIA um, issue to deal with. So just some of the, the, the challenges that we are experiencing, um, and one of that includes navigating the POPI Act 
For example, sampling becomes an issue when we find that organizations interpret the Poppy Act differently. So we have 26 public higher education institutions in South Africa. And at times, the way that they interpret the Protection of Personal Information Act differs and maybe contradicts each other. And this really impacts negatively on, on research methods. Um, within universities in South Africa, the, the challenge is how and where data is stored as well, causing further complications for sampling and, and data collection. We also have to grapple with the lengthy proposal and gatekeeper approval processes. So you may have a COIL project um, um, scheduled, but um, because of the lengthy process of um, ethics approval, you aren't able to then conduct your, your research. And lastly, as with all universities, administrative bureaucracy creates an issue for collaboratively conducting research, especially in the case of cross-border research. We found um, that this is an issue and becomes an issue for South Africa. And the research is showing, the qualitative research is showing um, that academic staff or faculty members don't actually want to conduct research collaboratively in a cross-border manner um, because of this issue. So some of the solutions that we've explored um, in the case of navigating um, the Protection of Personal Information Act, um, referral sampling, sampling, and this was co coined by Professor Peter Cunningham in 2020, allows for a modified version um, by word of mouth and volunteering for sampling. Um, taking the act of sharing personal information and contact details out of the equation. And this has helped in um, gathering data um, by ensuring that, you know, when you're doing something like snowball sampling, um, the Protection of per Personal Information Act and um, the impact of that isn't, um, um, isn't crossed. So in terms of um, data storage discrepancies impacting sampling and data collection, it's important to be persistent and resilient in navigating universities and their structures, um, as well as their processes by being flexible in, in your methods, which is not always easy, um, but having that flexibility um, has helped us. Um, and also, um, at DUT, we've um, explored doing a blanket COIL ethics proposal. So anyone who is uh, participating in a COIL project would have that ethics approval already when wanting to conduct um, research. Um, but I think that what we've noticed um, in terms of you know, the facilitators is that um, our academic staff and our faculty um, want to research COIL. Um, and it's usually a calling card for us to get academic staff involved in COIL. We tell them, you know, that you can take this into your research arena um, and, and really start publishing on, you know, this new pedagogy um, that is COIL. Um, so that is some of our experiences at um, DUT. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devinia. Thank you so much to all the panelists. And most of all, thank you so much to Hope and Emmy uh, for helping get this panel together. We are now we now have 10 minutes for any kind of questions that any of you all have. And just to get us started, it's Emmy is going to start with the first question. And then we will open it up to all of you for any other questions that you might have. So yes, uh, feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I'll start us off with one. A number of you talked about instruments that you used. How did, um, knowing that you have to go through some sort of ethics review process, influence the type of instrument that you chose for your assessment? Um, or how did that influence, you know, using it in a cross-border context, um, the instrument that you chose? Emmy, could you put the question in the chat? As sure. Well? Um, and maybe for a reference, uh, Tiffany, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I think you all had looked at a particular instrument, but uh, found out that it'd be really hard to get it through IRB approval. Um, 
and Lisa, I think you also commented on um, some of the transferability of an instrument in the U.S. context and the Brazilian context or language considerations there. Yeah, so I can go ahead and start um, and then maybe Tiffany or uh, Laura um, to, can join in. Um, yes, th there were certainly considerations. Uh, we have to be really careful in terms of the um, instrument to make sure that there were not, for example, colloquialisms or things that um, sing language that would not translate well, first of all. We had to make sure that there was data that was gathered in such a way that that student anonymity and um, just the protection of their privacy is honored. And so making sure that we don't ask questions that would then identify a small subgroup of students where you might then be able to um, go from there to think about um, you know, which students are, are answering these questions. Um, I think for us, another thing was making sure that we did not create something that would be overly burdensome for our students. So one of the things that um, I have learned about this past year, um, having participated in another international project, is that there are some other um, probably, honestly, more robust um, questionnaires that uh, exist um, that but they ask about 300 questions. And so for us in getting approval from I, our IRB, that would be seen as something that would be a pretty onerous task. Um, and, and our IRB is very careful about making sure that the burden of um, long time and energy is not excessive for our students. And so we did not go that route for that very purpose. I'll Thanks. piggyback on what Lisa said. And again, let me emphasize, Tiffany could probably answer this better than me, but she doesn't have a voice. <laughs> um, I would say ditto to all the things Lisa said. I mean, something you think about practical things within, you know, 300, there's a lot of really long surveys that are just not practical or, or difficult to get translated. Uh, the other, what I would add, I think with our experience is, um, so there's a lot of proprietary instruments in this space, right? Intercultural learning that you know costs quite a bit of money. <laughs> uh, and Penn State does subscribe to a few of those, but at times the way those are structured, it can make it difficult to bring in under a broader umbrella IRB, it's either because the way they store their data or who has access to that data or where that data is stored. Uh, some things like that can come into consideration. So we do not have, we only have one proprietary instrument in our toolkit because the, co the way the company that provides that structure oh. works well with the way so that so the individual instructors can have the data and also we can have access to the data for multi-classroom studies. Uh, but that's been an interesting one to navigate. And, and, and some of those instruments are very expensive. Uh, and and that's that's a factor. <laughs> Great insights. Thank you all. Um, does anyone else have a question that they want to um, drop in the chat or just unmute yourself, um, whether for everyone or for a specific um, specific panelist? Emmy, while we are thinking, may I just add one more comment? Mm -hmm. And that's that I think when you're thinking about the kind of um, survey that you want, it's really helpful to be very purposeful in terms of what kind of information do you want to gather from your students and what is most going to be most helpful for you as somebody who teaches. Um, for Mayara and I, because we teach in a professional school that has a very much a direct impact on patients and patient care um, and therefore patient outcomes, we really wanted to have a very big um, portion of our particular data that we're gathering that's really related very specifically about nursing students and some of these concepts they are applying when working with patients. That might look very different if we were gathering information from chemistry students or from history students. So I just add that to say, thinking about very carefully the kind of information you want from your participants, I think is a, is a really good starting point. Great point. 
Yes. The research um, is going to only be as solid as the data. So um, need to think that through from the beginning. Any we questions, other comments? Yeah. Yeah. We have three minutes more. And if there are no other questions, I might have one, but I wanted to give a chance to all of you all to see. Well, doesn't. Uh, so here's my question. How are, you know, this is also again for Lisa and Mayara or for anybody who can really uh, speak to this. How do you ensure the privacy and confidentiality of participant data when you share the data across both sides? Mayara, do you want to talk about this? Or do you want to talk? I think um, before, before, actually, when we are transcribing, um, the qualitative data, we have to work first in the material to de-identify the data. And this means to take out all names or all information that can uh, recognize the participants. So this is something that we have to take care about um, because it's not just the name, but sometimes participants say things that they could be recognized. And then we have to take care and treat the data <laughs> As, as we can say, just to 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 do that and to to make sure. But also, uh, we need to have like some code established just to guarantee that we we will identify afterwards which data is from each country. Um, so whether the students is from Brazil or from U.S., but do something like this. So this is one of the the things that we can do. Thank you. In our qualitative data analysis, too, what we did was looked at teams and, and utilized teams within our own countries first, and then got to broader categories before then we started to compare across countries. And that way, um, that level of abstraction was such that individual participants were, were um, not identifiable. I see a question in the chat. We have just one minute left. Would uh, Laura, Tiffany, Divinia, one of you all like to take this question really quickly? I think it's, a, I'll affirm it's a really good question. And there, I've worked now with, I think, 17 different countries. And there's always some stuff that doesn't align. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that where, where, where we're standards are and not necessarily you know, some people are more concerned with certain aspects of research ethics or, or uh, like we're not allowed to collect identifiable information in surveys. Uh, that's part of Penn State's policy, for example, level studies and other places they can have people put in their social security or, you know, very identifying bank accounts into surveys. And that's just an example. So uh, I would say just prepare for infinite variety. <laughs> uh, uh, and that uh, as a, as a I think there are some commonalities in terms of that students should provide consent in some way, shape or form and how that's done will vary considerably, but you can't use their work without their permission does seem to be fairly universal. After that though, uh, it varies a great deal. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, thank you for generously sharing all the resources that you have used in collecting data in IRB, your instruments and so on. Uh, hope will probably share all these with you uh, after uh, this webinar, as well as the webinar will be recorded and shared with you later. Uh, thanks for being here. We hope to continue this conversation beyond this session. Have a great day. <clears throat> great. Thank you all so much. If you want to unmute and say thank you in your mother tongue, I think our presenters would appreciate it. So please do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Obrigada. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Muito you. obrigado. Parabéns. Thank you. Hello. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thank you all presenters. Much appreciated. Osvaldo, no question from you. I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, not not at this point, you know. Um, I'm just learning. I was just uh, glad that to to hear that Mayara is doing the the hard work here because I'm probably gonna um, try to learn a lot from her. We have a lot of data, but uh, we haven't um, 
explore this in uh, in an academic way. So, uh, Mayara, I'm from Centro Paula Souza, so mm -hmm. Fatec is so so. Um, That's it. Um, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. So, uh, and um, uh, congratulations, Laura, for the incredible work. You know, up. Uh, you know, like <laughs> Jesus, you you. Gave you gave a, a round of applause because this is um, this uh, was so so um, enlightening for us because um, we're exactly looking for ways of trying to consolidate. We've been working with Coil for eleven years, and uh, um, so it's, it's about time that we start, uh, um, you know, getting data in academic. Um, uh, recognition for that. So, thank you very much. Happy, Divinia, to, share, happy to share anything and everything we can <laughs> that might uh, be vaguely uh, useful. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Divinia. Hi, Osvaldo. Yeah. <laughs> Charmila, good to see you. Good to see you, Lisa. Too. Lisa, do I know you from somewhere? I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I think I'm, we were 